Praise the Lord. Uh, welcome everyone to class this uh, morning. Um, it's a joy to see Abu Bakr, Linden, Aradna, Jafina, John Paul, Subashish join class. Thank you. Uh, also, welcome to all our e-learning students who are listening who will be listening to these lectures uh, later on. Um, last class we finished uh, studying uh, First Timothy. Today we'll uh, begin studying Second Timothy. Okay. So before we look at Second Timothy, can one of you please lead us in prayer, please? Can I ask Aratna? Can you lead us in prayer, please? Can Aradna or Subhashish, Linden, anyone lead us in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful day that you've blessed us with, Lord Jesus. Thank you for another learnings that learning that you have uh, encouraged us to, Lord Jesus. Thank you for uh, teaching us the first Timothy, Lord Jesus, as we start with the epistle of second Timothy, Lord Jesus. Let the Spirit inter intercede and let, us, let the Spirit teach us how Apostle Paul wanted Timothy to understand things, Lord Jesus, and let, let your Spirit lead us through in this uh, class, Lord Jesus. Help Pastor Selena be with her. And Lord Jesus, you help us to meditate on your word, Lord Jesus, and everything that we learn upon ab about this uh, chapters, Lord Jesus, about this book, Lord Jesus, help their, their, those uh, teachings be engraved in our hearts so that we could you know lord jesus we could you know work on this in our day-to-day -day life and as we, we start in our ministerial life lord jesus help that these uh, words of wisdom lord jesus guide us through lord jesus help and bless all the the fellow students who are joining this class lord jesus be with us all guide us let your holy spirit lead us through in jesus name we pray amen amen thank you Lyndon. Okay, so um, there's not much of a, a major introduction to Second Timothy like we looked at in First Timothy, uh, but you know, Second Timothy. What is the highlight of Second Timothy? Anyone knows what is the highlight of Second Timothy, or what is something striking about Second Timothy compared to Paul's other epistles? Compared to Paul's other epistles, what do you think is uh, what stands out about Second Timothy? I think Second Timothy is his last epistle. Yes, yes. Thank you, John Paul. Second Timothy is the last epistle that uh, Paul is writing. Okay, so Paul is basically uh, completed uh, or done twenty-four years of uh, ministry. He's traveled fifteen major cities. And uh, for 18 years, uh, Timothy has been with Paul, just uh, receiving from him, learning from him. Okay, And we see that uh, Paul, after his first Roman imprisonment, when he's free, you know, he uh, travels to Crete, where he leaves, uh, he does work there at Crete. He leaves young Titus there to oversee the churches at Crete. And then he goes on to Ephesus, where he... Um, uh, you know, looks at the work that is uh, done there and he feels a need to leave uh, Timothy behind to oversee the churches and to continue the unfinished work at uh, uh, Ephesus. And then, you know, uh, Paul goes down to Macedonia where he writes to um, uh, Timothy, the first letter of uh, Timothy, and basically there he's talking about more about uh, you know, how to put things uh, in place in the local community of believers at uh, Ephesus and how to lead the community or the church uh, at Ephesus. But we see that when he's writing um, uh, Second Timothy, you know, Paul goes on to Rome and there he is imprisoned for the second time. And he knows that death is imminent. Um, 
you know, he is going to die soon. Um, and he's very well aware of that. So he writes this last episode uh, to his son in the faith, who is uh, Timothy. And uh, he so desires Timothy to come and see him. But before uh, Timothy does come to meet Paul, uh, Paul is martyred just shortly after he writes this episode, about AD 68. And uh, traditions say that, uh, you know, he was uh, uh, beheaded. Um, uh, he couldn't die in any other way. He couldn't be martyred in any other way other than being beheaded because he was a Roman uh, citizen. Okay. So in the first letter of Timothy where we studied, we see that Paul is basically giving Timothy instructions on how to lead the local congregation of believers at uh, Ephesus, what are the things that he needs to do. But Second Timothy is more a personal letter where Paul is basically sharing specific instructions to Timothy on how to live his life as a minister of God. So it's more a personal letter, personal specific instructions that he is uh, giving to young uh, Timothy. Okay, so we'll begin looking at uh, chapter one. So, so can all of you please turn in your Bibles with me to uh, 2 Timothy chapter one. Okay, and we can follow through and uh, also some of us can read from uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1. So can one of you read uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1 verses 1 and 2 please. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, in keeping with the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dear son, Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lyndon. So Paul is acknowledging here that he is an apostle, you know, of Christ Jesus. Um, we're not going to look at uh, the meaning of the uh, term apostle because we I have uh, explained this quite a bit when I taught you Romans last semester and also when we studied uh, first Timothy okay so we all know who is an apostle what is the meaning of an apostle uh, so he's saying here that he's an apostle of Christ Jesus and usually he introduces his epistles when he's writing uh, he's making known to the readers who he is because he's basically trying to communicate to them with what authority he is writing or telling them what they need to do or how they need to conduct themselves in the body of Christ. So he's saying that he's an apostle by the will of God. Okay, so he's not saying that he's an apostle uh, because he wants to be an apostle. Like some of us, you know, can uh, call ourselves apostle so and so, prophet so and so, pastor so and so. You know, uh, because we like to have the name apostle or prophet uh, against our names. But Paul is saying, hey, I have not chosen to be an apostle uh, by my own self, but it is a call of God. It is the will of God and it is God who determines. So remember when we are studying uh, children's ministry, we looked at Ephesians where we saw that, you know, the fivefold ministry office um, offices, office gifts is particularly determined by Jesus Christ and when we are called to the office of an apostle or a prophet or a, a pastor, a teacher is specifically ordained by Jesus Christ himself and he calls people to that specific ministry offices. So Paul is again here reiterating the fact that he is an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. And interesting here, he says, according to the promise of life. Okay. Now, if you notice, this is a very, the statement is a very, or this phrase is a very unique uh, phrase or a statement compared to the other greetings in Paul's other letters. Uh, and it's very appropriate here that Paul is writing this because Paul who is imprisoned, you know, uh, is aware that death is impending on him. And he talk, he mentions about this later on in his epistle. But here he's basically locking into this truth or he's getting into this core truth that, hey, you know, 
even though this is our situation, this, even though this is my environment, this is where I am, this is my, now my, my future is this, but, you know, in the midst of uh, the uncertainty, in the midst of impending death, in the midst of, uh, you know, the pain and the suffering, you know, there is this hope that I can hold on to. And what is this hope is there is the promised life. And the word life here in Greek is zoe, which means it's the eternal life. It is the God kind of um, life. Okay. And so he's uh, very appropriately using this phrase here, according to the promise of life. And then he goes on to say grace, mercy, and uh, peace. Okay. Now, if you look at this uh, very, uh, uh, these three words, which, uh, which are very familiar, uh, you know, words that Paul uses in his, uh, in in his greetings in any of his epistles that he's writing, the letters that he's writing. But in most of his um, other epistles, generally Paul only uses uh, the words grace and peace in his greetings. So if you look at Romans chapter 1 verse 7, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 3, 2 Corinthians 1 2, Galatians 1 3, Ephesians 1 2, Philippians 1 2, Colossians 1 2, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, all chapter 1 verse 2, everywhere you will see he in his greetings he mentions only um, grace and peace. But when he writes to these pastors, Timothy and Titus, he's compelled to greet them with the words grace, mercy, and peace. So he's basically using mercy because uh, he's basically trying to say or to show that as ministers of God, hey, we need more mercy. You know, yes, we need grace and peace, but actually as ministers of God, we do need more mercy than anyone uh, else. And that is why he mentions this word in his greetings to Timothy and to Titus compared to his other uh, letters. Okay. And we know that uh, he says here, grace, mercy, and peace from God, the Father, and Christ Jesus, our Lord. So who is the source of grace, mercy, and peace? Who's the source of grace, mercy, and peace? Jesus, okay. God is the source of grace, mercy, and peace, okay. He's the one who is the giver of, uh, of grace, mercy, and peace. He's the one who blesses us with this. And when he blesses us, you know, his blessing is unlimited, okay. So grace, mercy, and peace comes from God and not from humans. So something that we can learn is even when we pray for ourselves or when we pray for others, we can also pray for God's grace, mercy and peace in their lives or in our lives when we are praying. And when we pray, just believe that, you know, his grace, mercy and peace will uh, flow in an unlimited and an abounding supply in our uh, lives. Okay. We'll move on to verses um, Three to verse, um, verse 7. So can somebody please read verses 3 to 7? Before you can read verses 3 to 7, anyone has any questions in verses 1 and 2? Okay. Then can somebody read verses 3 to 6, 7, please? Sorry, Abu Baker, sorry to interrupt. We can't hear you. Can the others hear him? I'm not able to hear you well. Not clear. Can you increase your volume of your mic, please, and read? It'll help. Thank you. It's slowly. I'm so the passage. Uh, can you hear me, Pastor? Can others hear them? 
I th- I was hearing the the Jefina reading, but I wasn't hearing Abu Bakr reading. Okay, okay Jefina, go ahead. Second Timothy chapter one verses three to seven. I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience, as my forefathers did. As without ceasing, I remember you in my prayers night and day. Greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Louise and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a soul. Amen. Thank you, Jafina. So here Paul in verse 3 is saying, you know, I serve God with a pure conscience. Now, if you remember in uh, the, in his the other epistle to Timothy, in 1 Timothy, you know, Paul emphasize, emphasizes about pure and good conscience at least thrice in that um, letter. So he talks about a pure and a good conscience at least thrice um, in uh, First Timothy. And now he states uh, the same here, but here he's talking in relation to how he has been uh, serving God. Okay, so he says he's serving God with a pure conscience. So something that we all can learn is that when, you know, all of us who desire to serve God, you know, we need to serve God with a clear, good and a pure conscience. Okay, we can only have a clear and a pure conscience when we live right before God and man. So God is not interested in how much we do for him. God is interested that we serve him in holiness and in purity and uprightness. And so Paul is saying that he is serving God with a clear, good and a pure conscience. So it's so important for us to learn ourselves that when we are serving God, that we serve him with a clear, good and a pure conscience. And Paul uh, is talking about the forefathers here. Uh, he is basically talking about uh, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and you know, the generations to follow. And he's saying that they too serve God with a pure uh, conscience, which means that the forefathers served God and they walked righteously before God and man. Now, you can question or you can debate and say, you know, how can we really say that Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, you know, walked righteously before God? There were so many things they they didn't, may not have done um, right, or, you know, we can question it. But, you know, um, yes, Bible is, scripture itself says that they walked righteously before uh, God, okay, but they walked according to the revelation that they had received at in their time, okay. So in that, in their time, their age, the revelation they received was very limited. According to the revelation that received at in their time, you know, they did what was right in the sight of uh, God, according to the revelation that they had at that time. But in the age, time, and age that we are living today the revelation that we have received is much greater than what you know uh, the forefathers in the old testament uh, received and the revelation that we have received today is the revelation that should guide us on how to live right in the eyes of god okay so paul is saying that you know even our forefathers they serve god with a clear good and a pure conscience so he's basically telling Timothy, Timothy, that even as you are serving God, you need to serve him with a pure, clean, and a good uh, conscience, okay? And then he, Paul says that, um, you know, that uh, he really, uh, you know, loves Timothy so much because Timothy is a son in the faith. Uh, he has so much of deep affection for Timothy um, that he's continuing to pray for. Timothy. So he's just telling Timothy, I know that you are in a in a difficult, challenging place. I know things are not uh, easy for you, but uh, be assured of my prayers. I'm upholding you. I'm supporting you in my uh, prayer. Okay. So this is uh, something very encouraging about Paul's life that, uh, you know, 
people who co-work along with him, his co-workers, co-laborers, uh, people who he has mentored in the faith. He just does not, uh, you know, uh, mentor them and leave them in a place to fulfill their assignment and role, but he continues to strengthen them, continues to uh, teach them, continue to help them and also pray for uh, them. So it's important that we also learn this from Paul's life that, you know, as ministers of God, it's important that we not only just preach and teach, but also to uh, continuously uphold people in our uh, prayer. Verse 4, he says, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with uh, joy. Okay, so Paul says he's desiring to see Timothy because he knows that he's drawing to the end of his uh, life. And so he desires to see him and he's saying mindful of your tears. So perhaps, you know, the tears Paul remembered by the tears Timothy would have shed during their last parting when the last time they saw each other. And then he's also talking uh, in verse uh, 5, you know, he goes on to talk about Timothy's genuine faith, okay? And he's telling him that his genuine faith was passed on as a heritage through the generations, okay? So this is what God desires. You know, God desires that uh, the faith that a, a generation has received, that that Faith is passed on to the uh, succeeding uh, generations. And we read this in Isaiah chapter 59, verse 21. God desires to see the spiritual truths. God desires to see the anointing. God desires to see the teaching uh, being passed on from one generation to the next uh, generation. And of course, we know that the anointing, the teaching, the impartation does not just happen automatically. Uh, you know, each generation has to work towards imparting, work towards teaching, ensuring that, uh, you know, the anointing, the, uh, the teaching uh, is passed on from one generation to the other generation. And how do you think, uh, you know, uh, people, we who are people of this generation, how do you think we need to pass on the truths, the revelations, the anointing, the, the impartation. How do we need to pass it on to the next generation? Any thoughts? Through teaching. Through teaching them the word of God. Okay, thank you, Lubega. Uh, firstly, yes, it's important that we teach them the word of God. What else? Through practice, through. Yes, go ahead, Lubega, and then we'll ask, ask, let John Paul speak. I was like saying that it, it should be through, through observation, through practice. When you we do practice what is right in front of others, they will learn through their eyes, not their ears only. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So it's important that we first are careful to model uh, things ourselves before we preach and teach. Okay, so first modeling or living out, uh, uh, you know, lives that are uh, righteous, holy, pleasing, acceptable in God's sight in front of our children, before our children, our grandchildren, okay, uh, so that they're able to look at what genuine faith is. They're able to see what holiness and righteousness really looks at like in everyday life. And then, of course, the important, the second thing is that we need to teach them, okay? Yes, John Paul, he was saying something. I was saying the same thing, being an example. Okay. Uh, thank you. Setting an example in, in, in speech, in life, in conduct, like Paul tells uh, Timothy. Okay. So um, uh, it's important, you know, you, I don't know if you've heard the saying, in the classroom, things are taught, but at home, things are caught more than taught. Okay. Uh, it's like a tongue twister. In the classroom, things are taught, but at home, more things are caught than thought okay so children are watching more our lifestyles what how we do how we live and they catch it more than what we are uh, speaking or teaching or telling them to
okay so that is verses um, four and five for us uh, we'll move on to verses six and seven it says therefore i remind you to stir up the gift of god which is in you to the laying on of my um, hands so paul is actually telling timothy hey timothy you know um, you're very gifted you're a valuable man in the kingdom of god okay but Paul is noticing that in Timothy there is, uh, you know, there seems to be a very timid streak in him. And uh, for this reason, we see that Paul is always encouraging him, uh, encouraging Timothy to be bold and uh, strong. Okay. Um, so, uh, and we also get a clue here from what Paul is writing to Timothy, that it appears that Timothy might have been reluctant, you know, to exercise all of his spiritual gifts. Uh, basically, may, maybe he's perhaps intimidated by people who are older than him. And that is why, you know, Paul is encouraging him. So if you look at first and second Timothy, uh, there is no less than 25 different places where Paul is encouraging Timothy to be bold, not to shy away from, you know, his roles, his responsibilities for what he needs to stand up for the truth, uh, how to stand up to be strong and bold and to teach the truth, teach the doctrine, to lift the truth, you know, to speak the truth. Um, and uh, he's, he's sensing or he maybe has noticed or he's heard that Timothy is not doing that uh, because, you know, he must be thinking, hey, he's young and there are people older to him. So maybe he's feeling a little intimidated about that and he's not being very strong and bold enough to stand up and confront uh, uh, people and confront ideas and ideologies. And so, you know, uh, Paul is telling Timothy, hey, Timothy, you're in a place of responsibility. Okay, and you need to recognize your roles and responsibility and, you know, you need to live up to that roles and responsibility that you have. So, you know, uh, 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 Paul knows that, you know, well, he's well aware that, you know, even as Timothy had to bear up to all these responsibilities, that Timothy needed to hear these things again and again. That is why we see, you know, uh, in First Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, Paul tell, encourages Timothy not to let people look down on his youth. Okay, and he tells him not to hold back and he exhorts him to exercise his, his gift. Remember, we read in First Timothy chapter 4, verse 14, where Paul tells him, uh, do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you through prophecy, to the laying on of hands of the elders. So he keeps reminding Timothy, and again here in um, verse 6, he's saying, hey, Timothy, stir up the gift, you know, stir it up. Uh, in uh, in you, okay. So, what does uh, the word stir up mean, or what is the picture that you get when you when you uh, read this uh, phrase or these words stir up? Any thoughts? Any ideas? It ma I, I think it it literally means work hard on them. Like revise hard, read the books around, pray to God fast, call upon God is anointing on you, and uh, that's what I think. I'm sorry if it's not the right one. <laughs> no, thank you, Lubega. It's basically yes, you know, stir up. You know, uh, means to uh, you know uh, keep alive. You know, rekindle. Uh, uh, you know, um, uh, or, you know, kindle a flame, you know, keep the fire alive, keep the fire burning, you know, keep the fire strong, don't let it die down, okay, stir up, you know, stir up what is there in you. So what are the simple ways that we can stir up the gifts of God in our lives? What are the simple ways we can stir up the gift of God in our life? So sorry, Abu Baker, we can't uh, hear you. You can type it in the chat section so that we don't miss on what you're saying. 
Hello, everyone. How do we stir up the gifts of God in us? Continuously being in His presence. Yes, thank you. Uh, continuously being in His presence. Yes, continuously be mindful that we live, move, and have our being in Christ. Okay, how do you continuously, uh, you know, be in God's presence? Okay, Abu Baker says, by using our gifts that God has given us, okay? How do you stir up the gifts of God in you? Okay, use the gifts of God, okay? Continuously be in the presence of God. How do you continuously be in the presence of God? Trying as much as possible to be with the right people around you who help you in the right direction. Of course, reading the Word of God, fasting and prayer are part of the story, to mention but a few. <laughs> yes, you know, it, the important thing, yes, is to read God's Word, uh, to spend time, uh, uh, you know, uh, praying, uh, you know, praying in tongues, praying time, yes, praying and studying God's Word. Thank you, Abu Bekha. Uh, Subashi says, when we use it by the power of the Holy Spirit, yes, you know, spending more time in worship, in prayer, in, in reading and studying God's word, you know, and like Lubega said, also associating with those who are flowing in the similar gifts. And like Abu Bekha said, use the gifts of God, uh, because when you use the gifts of God, you know, it, um, uh, uh, you know, um, and like Subashi says, when you use the gift of God, you are, you know, mindful of the power of the Holy Spirit, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And, uh, you know, you'll uh, become more stronger in those areas, uh, stronger in the, uh, 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 in the gifts of God, and you will flow mightily in it. Yes. So these are the ways that we need to stir up the gifts. So do all of you have the gifts of uh, God in you? Anyone here who says, I don't have any gift of God in me? So all of you are 100% sure that you have the gift of God in you? Yes. Okay. So when you don't see the gifts of God being used in your life, uh, you know the reason and you know what you need to do. You basically have to stir it up and you know how to stir it up, right? Okay. So we'll move on. He says, you know, uh, stir up the gifts of God, which is in you through the laying on of hands. So what does he mean by this? I've already explained to you when we studied First Timothy. Uh, so can you just um, highlight what I said? What does it mean when he says, uh, you know, stir up the gifts of God, which is in you through the laying on of hands? What does it mean? Do we receive, okay, can I ask this question? Can, do we receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit or we, do we receive the gifts of God only when people lay hands on us? Yes, no, can we have some answers, please? Not necessarily. Not, okay, not necessarily, no, okay, yes. No, because... No, we don't receive gifts from human beings. Who is the source or giver of gifts? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God himself who gives us uh, the gifts. Okay. But why is uh, Paul telling Timothy here as well as in First Timothy? You know, he says, you know, which you receive by through prophecy, to the laying on of hands, uh, like I uh, read in First Timothy chapter 4, verse 14. And here again, he's saying, you know, which is given to you uh, by the laying on of hands. Why is he mentioning this? Through prophecy, through laying of hands. Why? Hello, everyone. I explained this when we studied First Timothy chapter 4, verse 14. I hope it's all not gone out of the window. It's there in your minds, in your hearts. Okay, remember I said that spiritual gifts can be imparted and activated from one believer 
another believer. Okay, so you have the spiritual gifts in you. It's given to you by God, but it can be activated, which means it can be uh, initiated or it can get started. You know, you didn't know that gift is there in you and through uh, impartation, prophecy, uh, uh, laying on of hands, you know, somebody says, hey, you have this gift, you know, uh, of God in you, you use it. And so you're mindful of it. And then, you know, it's initiated, it started. So spiritual gifts can be imparted and activated by one believer into another believer. And the reason you know, we can, uh, uh, to stir, we need to stir up and set out to use the gifts God has given us is because the Holy Spirit through whom God has given us fills us with his power, okay? So it's very important that, you know, Paul is telling uh, Timothy that, hey, Timothy, you have received these gifts, you know, you've received it through prophecy or you've received it through the laying on of hands, all that is very good but you need to stir it up. You need to set out on, you know, using the gifts of God because these gifts have been given to you by the Holy Spirit, you know, um, uh, who fills you with power, okay? And that is why he goes on to mention in, in verse uh, 7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind so what he's telling him is the reason timothy why you need to stir up these gifts that you have received is because the holy spirit whom god has given to us fills us with his power fills us with his love that means he fills us with his power that is dunamis power he fills us with agape that is a god kind of love love and he's also given us a sound mind so what do we mean by a sound mind a sound mind means a mind that is a mind which is self-controlled disciplined you know uh has moderation there's moderation there is also self-governing ability Okay, so a sound mind is a mind that has self-governing ability. It is self-controlled and uh, disciplined. So God, Paul is telling Timothy that, you know, you need to stir up the gifts because of these reasons. Because the Holy Spirit has filled you with dunamis, which is the power of God. He's filled you with agape, which is the love of God, and he's given you a sound mind. Now, if you look at the sound mind in the ancient Greek, the ancient Greek word for sound mind has an idea of, uh, you know, a calm, self-controlled mind, uh, which is in contrast to a mind which is panicking, uh, which is confused, uh, which is, you know, uh, filled with fear or anxiety uh, when fearful situations um, arise. So, you know, um, he's saying that, you know, you have been given the sound mind and hence you need to stir up this gift. So even as you pray for yourself, you know, ask God, uh, you know, to, uh, to help you not to neglect the gifts that he has given you, you know, and do your part to stir up the gifts and you know how you need to do what you need to do to stir up the gifts and even as you uh, stir up the gifts you know you you just can't sit down and keep stirring up the gifts it's of no point if you don't step out and use the gifts so when you step out and use the gifts you thank god and be assured and say god even as i step out to to use the gifts that you have given to me for your glory, of course, you know, you have already filled me with dunamis, which is God kind of power. You fill me with agape love. So when you exercise those gifts, you exercise it with the love of God. You know, you don't exercise it uh, to receive um, glory for yourself. You don't um, exercise those gifts uh, in condemnation and also that you have a sound mind. So it's important that for some of us who are trying to live with a renewed mind, we don't have a sound mind, our mind is totally confused, battering us, oppressed, depressed. Uh, most of the time in panic mode, you know, uh, we continue to declare that, you know, you have a sound mind, that God has given you a sound mind. Declare that you have the mind of Christ because God's word says that. Declare that you have a sound mind, sound concentration, sound understanding, sound memory power. For some of you who are growing 
a little older and you're trying to and you're saying that hey i'm forgetting things i'm telling myself nowadays you know i have sound memory sound concentration keep telling yourself that because god has given us a sound mind amen all of us okay so interesting that paul mentions these three here he mentions power love and self control in the context of the gifts of God. And why is he using these three things in the context of the gift of God is basically because he's saying that the gifts of God must be exercised how? The gifts of God should be exercised not with, hey, hello everyone, you know, I have these gifts, I'm um, super powerful, superman, superwoman, you know, he man, she woman, whatever, you know, um, I'm super spiritual, no. It is, uh, you exercise his gifts in the power of God, or with the love of God, and in a self-controlled manner. Which means, you know, it's important that when you exercise gifts, you exercise in a self-controlled manner. Which is why Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, and he's saying, he's telling them, uh, in that context, he's not talking about that they should not be using or exercising their gifts. But in the context he's writing, he's saying, hey, all of you are flowing in the gifts, but when you come to church, there's total chaos, there's total disorder. So I want you to follow some order, some format, you know, uh, when you're exercising a gift, because everyone, when they come to church, they're so eager. One has a word of wisdom, one has a word of knowledge. Uh, some people have prophecies, some people want to speak in tongues, some want to interpret the tongue. And they're so mightily flowing in their gifts because they're so zealous uh, in the gifts of the Spirit that they're flowing in that. But when it comes to how to uh, you know, flow in the gifts in a corporate setting, Paul is giving them uh, directions there. So he's saying that even when you exercise gifts, you need to exercise it in a self-controlled uh, way. And another thing he's reminding us here is that fear must not hold us back. He's telling Timothy, don't let fear hold you back from exercising your gifts. Don't be afraid, uh, you know, uh, in the same way, you know, some of us, uh, all of us, you know, God has given us gifts. He wants us to use his gifts mightily for the extension of his kingdom. Uh, that is how people are going to come into the kingdom of God, like we see in the early church. You know, it's not only through the preaching and teaching, but it, they were, it was accompanied by signs, miracles, and wonders. And that is why whole towns or whole families, you know, where... Um, or even prisons, you know, uh, people were uh, accepting uh, Jesus, uh, God, uh, accepting the gospel because they were able to see the power of God so powerfully manifested through the apostles, through the early um, uh, believers and the uh, disciples. So don't be afraid. Uh, don't have the fear of uh, failing, you know, or the fear of uh, being wrong when you're exercising the gifts. Sometimes we can you know, do things out of the flesh, we can make mistakes, but always go back to your secret place, always ask God, God, why didn't the healing happen? You know, what did I not do right? What should have I done? You know, um, please show me, please guide me. I remember, uh, you know, uh, a man of God, a minister who I love listening to his sermons, uh, very powerful, great insights, great truths and uh, powerful revelations that he uh, you know, he makes it so simple for us. Uh, he was, uh, you know, mightily, he flows mightily in the supernatural, the whole church as well. So he was saying that he was, at one point of time, he was praying continuously for people with that same sickness, but he was not seeing healing or people being healed. And especially he was very heartbroken when a mother came with a child who had the same sickness. And, you know, um, uh, she came with so much of hope and she was so disappointed when the child wasn't healed. So uh, the pastor was saying that, you know, uh, he did not give up. He did not think, okay, God has called me to heal only such, 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 such diseases or give me breakthroughs in such uh, areas. But in this area, maybe God has called someone else. It's not my area. But he went into his the secret place and he spoke with God and he asked God, God, show me what I did not do right, what I need to do, you know, to get a breakthrough, to see healing, to see people heal in this area. So it's important for us uh, to do the 
um, same. Okay, so don't hold back in any way because God has not given us a spirit of timidity or fear, but of power and a love uh, and of love. Sorry. Uh, when God has given us these things, we don't accept what God has not given us. He's not given us a spirit of fear, so we don't accept that. You know, but what we need to humbly receive and walk in, in is what he has given us. He's given us a spirit of power, of love, and a sound mind. Can we say an amen to that, please? Amen. Okay. Then uh, We'll move on to verse 8. It says, Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. Therefore, the word therefore Paul has is using here is because Paul has just told Timothy about the spirit of power, love, and a sound mind, you know, um, which he's saying is a birthright for every believer in Christ Jesus. And now he's telling Timothy, you know, how to let uh, what God gave him to guide his thinking. Okay. So in the view of the spirit that God has given him, you know, he's telling him, do not be ashamed of speaking about the Lord. Do not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He reminds him in 1 Timothy, remember, do not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Here he's saying, do not be ashamed of speaking about the Lord. And also he says, do not be ashamed with identifying with other fellow ministers, genuine ministers of God, because there were some who were not genuine ministers of God. Uh, so, you know, do not be ashamed of identifying with genu genuine ministers of God, even if they are suffering for the sake of Christ. And then he's saying, share in the sufferings of the gospel. Okay. So what he's telling Timothy is God's power is that is God's dunamis, miracle working, supernatural power is what enables us to take our part in the suffering for the gospel. Okay, so he's saying, according to the power of God, Paul actually, you know, is, is uh, suffered according to the power of God. But, uh, you know, even though he was going through suffering, the power of God is always there. Okay, um, and Paul is reminded of that. So he's telling Timothy, hey, Timothy, yes, the power of God, the miracle supernatural uh, work, miracle working power of God, the dunamis power of God, yes, it's available uh, for us, uh, you know, but uh, it does not mean that, you know, God will remove away the difficulty. Sometimes, you know, God sees us through the difficulty, uh, but sometimes even if, you know, we succumb to the difficulty, we know that we have the power of God uh, in us in that situation give us the power and the grace to overcome it give us the strength to go through it um, and to sustain us through that difficulty and through that situation okay so um this is another import very important dimension of god's miracle working power that uh, you know god's miracle working power is not just there to perform great miracle signs and wonders through us, but also his miracle working power is available to give us the ability and the strength to endure sufferings, is to endure persecution, hardships, opposition for the gospel. Okay. I'll stop here. We look at verse 9 in um, uh, the after the break. Anyone has any questions? Any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, we'll uh, go for our break and then we'll come back and uh, we'll begin with verse 9. Thank you, everyone.